staying with the theme of insects that have the piercing sucking mouth parts in the order Hemiptera, I want to move into some that feed in a considerably different way. The subgroup in the order Hemiptera we call the true bugs. And the squash bug is, is the one I had the most familiarity with. I see it in uh, gardens here. I used to see it uh, when I grew up uh, uh, east of here. Um, and it's a, a mostly a problem on, on winter types of squash. So we're talking about uh, pumpkins and and uh, hard squash. Uh, it doesn't go into melons, doesn't go into uh, uh, cucumbers, other members of the uh, cucurbit family. The adult stage uh, is the overwintering form. Uh, females and males look pretty similar. Uh, the female in the upper left picture is the slightly larger one. You see the mating early in the year, about the time that um, the new squash crops come up and they uh, then start to lay eggs. Squash bug eggs are uh, laid as clusters, and there is no other insect that I am aware of on a vegetable crop in the United States that produces an egg anything like a squash bug egg. It kind of looks like a slightly flattened BB, um, and laid usually on the underside of the leaf, often in the leaf veins as indicated here, but it could be on a stem and some other parts of the plant. But small groups, and very visible. Uh, the eggs hatch, you get young stages. The young stages, of course, aren't uh, winged and they're considerably smaller. They might have a little more uh, blue-gray to them. Uh, and then they uh, get bigger with each molt. And as they get older, they uh, will also develop uh, visible uh, um, wing pads. So here's a squash bug nymph in the process of molting. You see her pull itself out of the old nymphal skin and ultimately becoming a, a, the next stage. So again, those wing pads uh, become increasingly visible as they get older. Some of the, the large ones here, you can see wing pads. Uh, perhaps the picture in the upper right is the best to show this. And then in the lower right shows an adult next to some late stage nymphs. Same insect, simple metamorphosis. Now, where these insects that we'll be talking about today differ from what we've just been covering is the way that they use their uh, piercing sucking mouth parts. These are not precision drillers into the phloem. They are not careful to uh, keep the, the cells alive so they can remain in place. They feed in a way that is called lacerate and flush. So they'll, they'll use their, their stylets essentially as a weapon to cause uh, mechanical damage to cells. They'll break and break and poke and poke and poke and poke break cells, then throw in a lot of digestive fluid uh, uh, in there, and then uh, uh, suck it all back up. And that's the lacerate with the, the, the stylets and flush it with the digestive saliva. And essentially every place they feed is a dead spot. So this is very different, uh, a much more damaging kind of way to use a piercing sucking mouth part than we saw with the aphids and the, with the white flies. So uh, you'll see dead areas in the leaves, um, if they get in the stems, they may kill areas so that then water can't be moved, so it just uh, uh, wilts. Uh, mast feeding can cause uh, the stems to collapse. Uh, this is not an uncommon thing to occur late in the summer in areas where you have a lot of this squash bug. And then they move on to the fruit, uh, and uh, often the, the, the fruit is... Uh, pretty resistant to the effects, but you will see things happening. Uh, again, they are going to uh, feed in a way that kills the cells. So say you had a, a fruit and a little area on the, the surface was killed, that could be a dead area that could allow decay in. And that's sometimes what we see is, is pumpkins get um, uh, damaged by squash bugs, make little pockets, bacteria, fungi get in, and then the pumpkins collapse. The initial wound being made by the squash bug, ultimate collapse by the uh, pathogens. In other plants, it's a little different. Uh, maybe occasionally, I see it in, in a summer squash like zucchini, and I don't see the um, uh, dead area obvious. I see a little gumming response. So everywhere they feed, there's a little, little uh, uh, ooze wounding uh, from the wound site. And then they, the, the, the plants may... Uh, overgrow these wounds. Um, so in this case, this is a fairly hard squash, a kabocha type of squash. And it's got a very hard rind. 
and internally this is this is fine uh, but the outside of the uh, the squash in this case uh, does look not very appealing uh, all the little pebbly areas those are those are callous sites of callous tissue that's been growing over the wounded area where the squash bug had earlier fed and damaged there is one other issue I've never seen it but uh, it's uh, around involving a bacterial disease that is spread by uh, squash bugs. So it's called cucurbit yellow vine decline. So in this case you'd have uh, vines that, that turn yellow and the yields go down. Um, the picture in the lower right shows uh, some discoloration you'll see uh, from uh, infection by this uh, bacterium which grows uh, in the phloem. Uh, this cucurbit yellow vine disease, again caused by a bacterium, it survives between season within those adult squash bugs, so it is an obligate vector here. It's introduced into young plants with squash bug feeding, and it's only been recognized in the state since 1991, mostly in the Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana area, but it has been found in, in many other areas, particularly in the eastern U.S., so one to watch for. Again, it's a yellow vine decline it's not a wilt and around here um, I live in an area where squash bug is kind of at the edge of its its territory and this is some of the things I say for for here in Colorado that one of the things I've learned is is uh, it is an insect that kind of tracks with how severe was the previous winter if we have a, a hard winter a hard open winter uh, squash bugs don't survive very well so the next year is not usually not a bad problem but uh, if we have warm winters uh, then they survive better and we have a worse problem the following season another thing that uh, to get developed in Oklahoma that makes sense and this is this is what I uh, I tell people and if they're going to treat it is to go after it early um, Insecticides should be directed at the, the first generation, and I guess I forgot to mention there will be two generations, one laying eggs in June and the other laying eggs later in the year. And uh, it, it makes sense to go after this uh, first generation for a couple of reasons. The plants are small, uh, the plants are easily checked, the plants don't have flowers on them yet usually, um, the uh, uh, plants can be sprayed more completely whereas if you waited until August you've got flowers you've got plants that are sprawling all over the place and uh, it's much more complicated and less effective so suggested recommendation check your plants uh, these eggs are very easy to to see um, you could crush the eggs if you wanted to in a small planting but if you're treating it uh, with an insecticide uh, first time you see the eggs uh, treat then and then maybe about two weeks later and you'll pretty much have bracketed that first generation and knocked it out uh, and that will probably get you through the year without having uh, serious problems with this from that point on and again you can have much more targeted spraying and much smaller area you don't have the conflict with potential uh, uh, damage to pollinators because the plants don't have flowers on them yet and then a lot of the action with the squash bug occurs at the base of the plant uh, so particularly where, when it gets hot they will they will hide at the base of the plant often or in shaded areas so a lot of the action happens there and then they come back out but uh, if you wanted to, to just direct the, the an application at the base of the plant that would pretty much get most of uh, the squash bugs without having to spray a much wider area so that's that's the key point in the plant where we want to uh, treat for this and then one thing is mulches don't aren't a good thing with uh, these kinds of crops so at least around here uh, if we put straw mulches uh, around the plant I'm not uh, and something that provides cover uh, then squash bugs are develop higher numbers on those plants uh, they it, it, the the, the, the uh, mulch is a little more it provides some shade and and that's a good uh, that's something that they're looking for so we, we get more squash bugs if we have say a straw mulch than over bare soil so mulches can be great for some things and some things they're they're not so good another uh, vegetable insect that I'm going to give just a brief bit uh, on would be harlequin bug uh, it's uh, an insect that affects the cabbage family plants uh, almost entirely 
Um, and it is a very good looking insect. Uh, a harlequin um, is a if you've never heard that term, a harlequin is a, a name given to a, a godly costumed French clown of the 1800s. Anyway, but some of the insects that had bright colors were called harlequins. The uh, uh, insect uh, feeds in the same way, um, but the kind of injury you're going to see are going to be a little bit different. Uh, again, here's the adults, brightly colored life cycle. Um, of the harlequin bug is they'll start with eggs and let me just uh, spend a little time here on the on the eggs so so this is the first squ uh, stink bug that we're going to deal with stink bugs are a family of of insects and stink bugs lay very distinctive eggs and they're usually uh, barrel shape. They're not always colorful like the harlequin bug eggs are here, but they're uh, laid in masses and, and quite large. And then uh, typically after the nymphs of a stink bug hatch from those eggs, you'll see them around the eggs for several days. And we'll see that again with some other stink bugs we'll talk about in just a sec here. So harlequin bug is mostly uh, attacking vegetable crops um, in the cabbage family and they will feed in a destructive way like a squash bug will. The, the piercing sucking mouth parts will lacerate and flush a, a local area. The response is a little bit differently because the kinds of plants we're talking about, uh, cabbage family plants have thicker, waxier leaves, so um, they are uh, the, the symptoms are a little more muted than you might see in a, in a squash uh, on a squash leaf uh, with the squash bug, but the area is uh, 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 largely destroyed at a feeding site. So. Severe injury results in areas of dead tissue. Uh, if they are feeding on young tissues, and we'll get more into this as we go along, if, if a, an expanding leaf is, is fed on, then that can result in that leaf becoming distorted or maybe even uh, being killed. Uh, so uh, this is an insect that is, is spotty in areas, and uh, uh, but uh, one that uh, uh, particularly in the southern uh, United States is, is often a problem in uh, cabbage family plants. Another family of insects uh, that feeds in this way, this lacerate and flush feeding way, is a, is a family of, of bugs with a kind of un, uh, unremarkable name, uh, plant bugs. So one family of, of, of insects are the plant bugs. Uh, um, it's not a, a great name, but when I tell somebody they have a problem with a plant bug, they're never impressed uh, because, yeah, it's a bug on a plant. But there is one family that are the plant bugs, the family Myridae. And these occur on a, on a wide variety of crops, particularly one group, the Ligus bugs. But uh, uh, they also have that last rate and flush feeding. Uh, I show this uh, series of slides of, of some uh, of a species called the four-lined plant bug. This is an eastern species. But why I like uh, this picture uh, is the one on the right shows the damage it produces uh, on, a, on a cucumber leaf. Not a common host, they're more often on shrubs, but on a cucumber leaf. And you can see, uh, I think, in that leaf that every spot, all those dark spots, every one of those was a, a feeding site. And so that kind of illustrates the kind of injury that would be caused by a single feeding event. Four-lined plant bug would be one we see again more on, on ornamental plants. In the picture in the lower left, it, it's a leaf that uh, was fairly thick and, and the area gets uh, callus tissue formed around the wound site. So that's what we're seeing with the lighter colored spots in the lower left. But uh, that's not a very common one on, on fruits and vegetables. Uh, in some areas, uh, particularly again south southeast, there's a plant bug that has the name garden flea hopper, which is a true plant bug. Uh, it's in the order Hemiptera. Uh, it's a little variable in terms of how they might appear. Some are winged, uh, the ones in the lower left are winged, and some are wingless, the ones on the lower right are wingless, but they can jump. So this is a jumping plant bug. Um, if I were to see something like the picture, the upper left picture or the lower right picture, I mean just eyeballing it that sort of looks like a flea beetle and then it jumps and 
but no, it's a, a garden flea hopper, a plant bug. It's going to feed in a very different way. You're not going to see shot holes. You're going to see uh, little dead spots where these feed. So lots of little flecking wounds, uh, in this case to squash, and here's on t tomato. Um, so uh, quite a different feeding type, even though they superficially might look like a leaf hopper, and they hop, excuse me, a, a, a flea beetle, and they hop. Um, uh, very different kind of feeding. Now the big group of plant bugs are in a genus called Ligus. So you'll maybe hear them called Ligus bugs, or some of them have specific uh, common names. Tarnished plant bug is perhaps the best known. And then in the western U.S. it's the western tarnished plant bug. And then there's also the pale legume bug. These are all a Ligus species of some kind. And uh, extremely wide host range with this group of plant bugs. Um, this would show uh, the various stages of the of a, of a typical uh, ligus bug, the western tarnished plant bug in this case. Uh, the eggs, which are in the very uh, uh, far right corner, the lower right corner, are, eggs of these are inserted into plant tissues, usually a midrib or, or vein, but you have uh, various nymphal stages that feed and molt and get bigger, go through five nymphal stages. The last one would be the adult. Now, ligus bugs can feed on, on foliage. If they feed on foliage, they tend to feed on new growth, uh, so emerging leaves. So a little bud, that's, the leaves are just coming out, and they will feed on that and then kill areas of those emerging leaves. And so the kind of response you might see if ligus bugs had been feeding on young leaves when they were young is that when those leaves expand, there are areas that were dead. And those didn't develop, and the areas around them did develop. So you get maybe a little bit of a curling, and, and some of the dead areas may drop out as the, the leaf area expands. So, so these are injuries that you might not see until the leaf really fully expands, but occurred when the leaf was was still uh, emerging and they fed and, and killed spots on the emerging leaves. Uh, it could be a direct pest, uh, in this case uh, in celery in uh, California, they will feed on, on the plants and cause a discoloration that would be a market grade defect on the stock. So that could be a, an issue as well. Again, the areas where they feed on are going to be killed. And they might develop in, in fruit and flowers. So uh, if we get into ligus bugs in ornamentals, we might talk about them uh, damaging certain kinds of ornamental flowers. And they might cause spotting or little twisting of the petals. Or in the picture in the upper right, uh, the flower didn't fully emerge because part of the flower bud was killed as it, as it uh, was, was coming out. But uh, ligus bugs will, will often... Uh, damage flowers at, at various stages, as well as newly de developing leaves. They'll also develop uh, newly developing flower buds. And if you have a an injury to a very young bud, uh, often that, that's so much injury that the bud will often abort. So one of the big issues with ligus bugs is, is flower abortion. Uh, and so that can cause reduced uh, yield of some crop we're trying to get the fruit from, say. Um, but if the flower, if, if, if the buds don't abort, if the developing fruit stays on the plant and it's been injured, then we get a distortion, which we call a cat facing injury. And cat facing injuries would be a, 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 a situation where the fruit is not developing uh, in perfect form because an area of the fruit when it was young had been damaged. Uh, so we saw that in a, in a couple of different cases with chewing insects. I, I showed it uh, with the climbing cutworms, chewing a hunk, and then the fruit came out with a, a big dimple. I also showed a couple examples with weevils that chew a little, little hole into a developing fruit, and then it comes out distorted. Well, the big group of insects that causes distortions of fruit are these insects with sucking mouth parts that kill the area where they feed. And there's four common families of, of these true bugs that can be 
cat facing insects in in orchards uh, in particular. Uh, one would be the plant bugs, uh, one would be the stink bugs, and then there's uh, two other families, the leaf-footed bugs and the scentless plant bugs that also feed on developing uh, developing uh, seeds and can cause distortion of fruit and seeds. So here's, here's some apples and these are apples that are in early stages of development and the one on the, the left you can see well I can see four dark spots the, they look a little raised those are four points when that fruit was younger where a plant bug fed uh, and the one on the right you can see a, a spot that looks a little dimpled and kind of discolored around it that was a single feeding site by a plant bug there so these areas these injured areas, these will no longer grow. They're dead, but the tissues around them will grow, and then you get these very sunken uh, kinds of points. So these would be cat-facing injury to apple and pear in my backyard. Cat-facing injuries are, are quite common on strawberry. Ligus bugs are generally considered the key pest in strawberry production, key insect pest in strawberry production in much of the United States. So again, a, a young berry uh, is fed on in a single event by a passing ligus bug, a plant bug. That area is dead. The, the uh, uh, flesh no longer grows normally. You get these little pockets of uh, excessive seediness. Now other things could cause this. Uh, could be a could be frost injury or uh, some other causes, mechanical injuries, but often it's plant bugs if you see that symptom, this cat facing. On uh, fruiting vegetables, cat facing could occur on a, on a pepper, and uh, this is a greenhouse pepper that we're uh, in the upper left picture where the young pepper was damaged in a point or maybe a couple of points the f pepper fruit continued to grow except around those damaged areas and it came out distorted now you don't see that response on a tomato it's a uh, uh, more fleshy and uh, you will see dead areas uh, or cloudy areas on the surface and if you look internally uh, they'll be um, kind of corky and spongy and uh, a little lighter in color um, just underneath those wound sites so there is wounding and it does extend internally but you still uh, get the the tomato will, will not be uh, deformed it'll just be discolored with little spongy areas in it the other big group, uh, aside from the stink bug, excuse me, aside from the, the the plant bugs, the stink bugs are are the, the other big ones of the four that I talked about. So plant bugs probably number one, stink bugs number two. Although if you go into the southeast part of the the, the country, probably stink bugs are uh, probably number one. There's more serious species in in uh, the southeastern U.S. So green stink bug is probably the most important one. Uh, uh, here in this picture we have on the right, we have an adult on the top and a nymph on the bottom. Remember, you know, they've got simple metamorphosis, and, but they can look fairly different in these two stages because the nymph doesn't have the fully developed wings. Picture on the left I love because it's uh, got the mouth parts, shows those mouth parts right there, uh, right in the middle. So uh, green stink bug feeds on a, a huge number of plants and it's a problem in fruit crops as indicated uh, in the upper left picture. Uh, many kinds of legumes are notoriously uh, susceptible to stink bugs and uh, in this picture uh, in the on the right you can see lima beans that had been damaged uh, when stink bugs fed on the developing beans. Tomatoes I've already mentioned, the, it, it shows as a discolored area, um, and but internally uh, you also see some white spongy uh, areas as well. So stink bugs, plant bugs, very similar kinds of injuries, um, and uh, the two big cat facing uh, insects we have. Speaking of stink bugs, uh, one that many of you have probably heard of, uh, one that's in in the news, a uh, fairly recent invasive, is called the brown marmorated stink bug. First uh, found in North America in 1998. Um, it does have a, I think, a terrible common name. Um, I don't know anybody who knows what marmorated means or didn't before this insect came around, but marmorated means marbled. So that is um, a reflection of one of the, the patterning you'll see on the back of this. Anyway, I wish they'd called it something else. But 
It's the brown marmorated stink bug, uh, first detected in North America and Pennsylvania. And since that time, the mid-Atlantic states really have been the area where this has been most important, but it has steadily spread. Uh, it is similar to many kinds of stink bugs. There's many kinds of brown colored stink bugs, but if you wanted to ever know if you had brown marmorated stink bug, the features you look for is the antennae. There should be bands on the antennae, and then there are these white markings around the edges of the abdomen, but that alone would not uh, get you to this insect. The two, those two features are what you keep in mind. Eggs of this brown marmorated stink bug, again, uh, showing another stink bug's eggs, not quite as spectacular as those harlequin bug eggs, but still pretty good looking eggs laid as a mass. The eggs hatch. The nymphs cluster around the eggs. Again, a, an, a common habit among the stink bugs. For several days, they'll remain around the, the egg mass. Um, so those would be at egg hatch what they look like as they get older. They get uh, bigger. They look a little bit different. They get uh, a little grayer. They might get a little, a little bit spiny. So here we see some in a leaf. We also see a green stink bug. Uh, you can see there's two different kinds of nymphs, of uh, two different species, nymphs of the brown marmorated stink bug predominantly and one green stink bug nymph. So brown marmorated stink bug, like the green stink bug, will feed on the developing fruits of, of many kinds of plants. Uh, in this case, we see several ones on peach. And a, an injury to something like a peach uh, would result in a dead spot. And if there was a couple of dead spots, uh, as indicated in this picture, uh, we'd have uh, the symptom we, we see here. The, the rest of the fruit, in this case, continues to develop. If it had been a very young fruit, maybe those injuries would have caused it to abort. But if it survives, it comes out and it's cat-faced. Um, other plants may respond a little bit differently if they feed on a, a larger, later stage of, of apples, for instance. Uh, you won't see the, the cat facing, but if they feed through the flesh, the area underneath that is uh, damaged. You get these little corky areas underneath the flesh. Um, so here's a, a nice sequence. I like this, uh, uh, showing the, the feeding uh, wound of the brown marmorated stink bug. So, all you'd see externally is that little little dot. That's where the stylets went in. Picture on the right shows the track of where the stylets went in within that apple fruit. And then in the lower left is the plant reaction and when what happens in response to that feeding. We're already seeing a little dimpling in that picture on the lower left. Very nice set of pictures from the stopbmsp.org uh, website here. And then ultimately it uh, it results in these little uh, little corky areas inside. Again, a, a pretty serious market defect that may not be all that obvious from the apple's uh, out, outside appearance. Another thing brown marmorated stink bugs bring in is that totally separate from what they do to plants, they can be an issue because they are one of the nuisance invaders of homes. So a nuisance invader would be a, a kind of insect that comes into buildings for some reason, doesn't reproduce, just is there. And uh, uh, of all the stink bugs, brown marmorated stink bug is the only one that's ever had this habit. Uh, but they tend to move to houses if they're available as a way to spend the winter. They'll commonly be found most often in upper stories on the, on the south and west sides of the building where they come in. And People don't like having a lot of stink bugs uh, around in the house, and, and this is this can be uh, pretty uh, um, pretty impressive. Um, there was fairly recently a, an article in New Yorker magazine. Anyway, uh, not sure if any of you read this, but it was all about brown marmorated stink bugs and invading homes, and uh, it made it sound uh, like the end of the world in this article. But they they are a nuisance invader, and you'll see them. Uh, if you live in areas where these are common. They're not common here. Uh, where, where I live, uh, those two on the lower left uh, are the kinds of bugs that come into houses around here. Box elder bug, if you've got box elder maples, they're in houses anywhere. Um, and what's called the western conifer seed bug, uh, one of the leaf-footed bugs that sometimes feeds on fruits, but uh, mostly feeds on conifer seeds. But both of those are ones that 
come into houses in the fall and people find them all winter long in their house. But that's a separate issue, nuisance invader 